Hello, friends. This is Dave Hurwitz, executive editor at ClassicsToday.com with Ask Dave. And the question here is, is there a problem with listening to individual movements of things in preference to complete works when those individual movements are part of larger things like, you know, the opening movement of Beethoven's Fifth, for example, or something like that? And my answer to that question is no, there isn't any problem with it at all. In fact, if you look at the issue historically, and this is really actually, it was a fascinating question, and I'm really grateful that, that the, the viewer asked it. If you look at things historically, treating works as wholes is a very new thing, a really new thing. It's the result of a whole bunch of circumstances that have come up in the intervening centuries. There is, first of all, the, the, the worship of the composer as sort of the artist hero, um, the idea of, of Werktreu, that is that it's the artist and the listener's obligation to somehow pay attention to or care about the composer's original conception of the piece. Um, and the assumption, of course, and it's an assumption that if a composer writes something in four movements, you're supposed to hear all four of them. Um, not that, you know, the composer would not prefer that normally. I'm sure most of them did. But would they have a real problem if you didn't hear it that way? And the other thing that's happened, and really probably the most important thing in creating this impression we get that you have to take in complete works in toto, um, all of them at once, at one sitting, is uh, the advent of radio broadcasting and recordings, because recordings present them to you that way. So you really have very little excuse not to listen to them that way. But back in the day, back in the day, before all of the electronic media and all of these, the, this sort of concatenation of circumstances that led to this concept of the wholeness of the work. I mean, there was also like horrible German 19th century philosophy that had all kinds of nonsense about wholeness and oneness and unity. And it, you know. Anyway, um, pieces were not played complete. Everybody liked individual bits. Individual bits were encored. Isolated bits were performed. And in those days, back before they had, you know, electronic media, uh, the idea was just to play what you could play and do what you could do um, and not worry so much about doing things in their, in their original format. We all know the stories, right? Beethoven's Seventh. The second movement was so popular it was stuffed into the Eighth Symphony or played separately entirely. I mean, excerpted, there were arrangements made of the most popular movements. I mean, Haydn's military symphony, the second movement, that military movement was, was incredibly popular in arrangements all by itself. The clock from Haydn's clock symphony. These things got nicknames because these popular bits were played separately. And nobody had much of an issue about it. They just did it that way because in order to consume the music at home, the composer had no business telling consumers how they, they were supposed to consume the product in question. Even as late as Mahler with his third symphony, uh, he complained actually, because Mahler being Mahler, that the second movement of the third symphony, the flower piece, was always performed separately. And, and drove Mahler nuts. He said, they're all going to get the wrong impression of me by hearing this piece outside the you know, context of the whole work. But then, of course, he said, but what can I do if I want to get performed? You have to do it. And Mahler himself, when he played Bruckner Sixth in France, he only did two movements. He did like the slow movement and the scherzo and learned just the scherzo, actually, I think, maybe one movement. And you know, he cut the crap out of it the rest of the time. So, so you know, the way that people consumed music was very different historically. It's only when it became possible to invariably experience these pieces whole that that became what was considered to be a, a moral imperative. Now, my own feeling about this is that I always prefer hearing works in, in their complete form. I, I think that they're best experience that way. I think, not even if you respect the composer, I think it's just a better listening experience, number one. And, and number two, um, if I don't have time to listen to a work in its entirety, I will listen to something shorter and listen to it in its entirety. But, but there are many, many times, I mean, I'm on the train, I'm hanging out, I'm, I'm, I'm relaxed, I, I just play bits. I play the bits I want to hear. 
There are things that I like to listen to in their, in their little sniglet form. And I listen to them in their little sniglet form. I mean, Rimsky Korsakov's Capriccio Espanol. You know, I like to sort of skip the opening with all the, the variations and just go right to the, right to the da 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 you know, the, the fun part of the fandango or whatever that thing is at the end. I, I, that's the part that I like the most. And so that's the part that I listen to the most. I mean, I often listen to the entire work. I like the whole work. But if that's what I'm feeling like, that's what I do. And so the bottom line, for me anyway, is that is that we should never tell people what's right or what's wrong in terms of their listening habits. We should simply encourage them to listen. That is what matters. And some people may actually start to get curious and wonder what the rest of it sounds like and want to hear the whole thing, and they'll enjoy the whole thing, and some will not. And if they don't, it's fine with me, as long as they're participating in the listening experience. You know, I mean, audiences, remember, back in Brahms Day or whatever, they would applaud. They would applaud when they heard anything they liked in the middle of movements, at the end of movements, between movements. Applause was was always a sign of approbation. And con composers and artists wanted approbation very badly. <laughs> they wanted approbation from the audience because it told them what people would like or if they did something that people enjoyed and it was a sign of approval. Who doesn't want a little approval? You know, we, we, we do have to get away. Much as I, I absolutely, like I said, tend to prefer things complete wherever possible. We do have to get away from the castor oil school of classical music appreciation, which is you listen to it because it's good for you or because there's some sort of moral value in the way that you listen. I mean, that's just crap, frankly. There is none whatsoever. It's all about your pleasure, your enjoyment, your entertainment, and you have every right to do it in whatever way works best for you um, or works best for anybody else, and nobody has the right to tell you otherwise at all. And the only justification, in my view, for saying that we should listen to complete works is because it's a better listening experience. It's, it's more enjoyable. Um, you hear more. You hear more stuff. Um, there's a greater emotional range, greater dynamic range, greater contrast. There's it's a better listening experience. But if it's not a better listening experience for anybody, then that whole argument just, just you know, goes out the window. And that's the way it is. So I hope this answers your question. I do not worry about it. I do not worry about, in this specific case, the tendency of electronic media, um, digital media particularly, um, to present classical music in small bits, in sniglets, because there's a market for it. And if there's a market for it, then let them have what they want. And there's a market for listening to works in their entirety. And they're both equally valid and perfectly fine with me. So keep on listening, friends, however you choose to listen. And take care.